<coughs> Thanks so much. And um, I'm glad to take some questions. Um, questions about uh, whatever, whatever you like. Uh, if you uh, want to talk about stuff that was in the presentation, fine, or other things, that's, that's fine. And um, um, I can moderate them. I'm used to take getting angry faculty questions whenever I go to town hall meetings. There's almost nothing you can't throw at me that I won't be able to handle. Except if Hajar once asked me a question. Not, not you, Kaz. This is not a neuroscience meeting. Well, I get, I'm not going to ask you whether the brain is more important than the heart. And that's, which is one of well, the it's obvious because I know a lot of people in our, in our capital and so on that get by fine without a brain, and but, but a heart. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you can't get by without. You need at least a couple of ventricles. If one good ventricle you can get by. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So I wonder whether, um, how does religious ex extremism, you know, that's around the world, especially in those areas that you have mentioned, kind of counter all these efforts which are made to Im kind of improve the, the, uh, the education, which in some of these cultures is seen not as a good thing, especially for women. So is there a problem with that, do you see, in, uh, as an effort, you know, to A cultural over? problem. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. And uh, um, thank you for reminding me to be sensitive to that problem. Uh, the point I made, for example, about uh, um, multivitamin and mineral supplements in some cultures, uh, we take a lot of this stuff for granted. And uh, every culture is different. Uh, you can find that out just by walking six blocks in Manhattan. And, uh, and the culture, cultural differences that we encounter in these parts of the world, everything has to be looked at, if possible, through the lens of a local culture. There's two ways to do that that I know about. One is to devote your professional career to being a part of another culture like, like uh, Warren has done. The other one is to listen to the local partner and let him or her direct traffic on what problems need to be solved and what acceptable solutions might, might be possible. And I'm learning so much uh, by co-chairing this uh, Africa-US effort about three things. I'm learning a lot about uh, how important that is that you listen to the local partner. I'm learning about how hard it is and how I've faced my own biases and my own certainties that if some area is an area of my own expertise, you know, which is narrow, well, of course, I know exactly what you should do to develop X or Y, but I don't know anything about the culture. And then I've learned how hard it is to get very, very successful, highly productive uh, teachers and researchers in the developed world to give over the helm to a partner in a culture that doesn't have all of the uh, infrastructure that we have. But it's a constant, it's a constant discipline that has to be there. And um, it's probably, it's, I'm so grateful that you brought it up, Kass. It's probably the biggest roadblock to actually getting some of these things done after the infrastructure and, and resource roadblocks, which are amazing. For example, when I was visiting the program in Bahardar, Ethiopia for the master's degrees, they have about half of the time where they have to schedule no power because they don't have a power grid. And they have a 38,000 student university. So, you know, the next time the email goes out for 15 seconds and you get all excited, Think about Bahardar University where the power's out half the time. And uh, if you go to a really good hotel, they have a candle in the, in the, um, in the drawer uh, in, in the bedstand. So that's a very important point. Thanks for raising it. And I'll thank you not to ask any more good questions that show that I forgot to say something. I don't come to your neuroscience lectures and ask you <laughs> what's more important, the brain or the heart, you know. Think about Washington, D.C., and you'll see what I'm saying. <laughs> Hi. Questions? Uh, yeah. Hi, Dr. Scott. Oh, hi. I'm just wondering, um, what are some of the funding opportunities for Cornell students and uh, not nine, um, initiative um, Global House Projects in Cornell? Funding yes. opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, three, uh, there's three answers to that. Um, the, the first answer always in every part of every university um, is to go first to the department or college to see what's there. Almost every uh, department, almost every college at a university like Cornell has some small wherewithal to help a particular short-term uh, thing get done to a limited extent. And um, obviously, uh, uh, this, the second level, which would be the, the better level, is to have a more university-wide grant program. And uh, David Hadjar and a former provost at uh, Ithaca, Biddy uh, Martin, for example, set up a, um, a seed grant program for a different kind of research between the campuses where many students and many uh, postdocs were involved in those grants, not in the area of public health specifically. But there's no reason why such a program couldn't cover global health topics. And certainly things that were re relevant to global health came out of that. 
The bigger sources of funds for these projects that are field work either tends to come from philanthropy of very um, uh, dedicated, uh, generous people. Uh, Warren has uh, gotten uh, that kind of philanthropy uh, at, uh, at Wild Bogondo uh, and, uh, and some other areas, or from occasionally federal agencies in one country. We always tend to think about the U.S. because there's so much more money here than anywhere else. Um, and then thirdly, outside foundations. Now, the trouble right now is that even these foundations that have huge multi-multi-billion dollar endowments have suffered losses in the endowments because of the recession. And one thing that I've run into, um, I spend a lot of time representing your good work, so to speak, by going to foundations and talking broadly about these kind of things. And one thing I've found in the area of um, international uh, outreach, including but not limited to global health, are larger foundations who have smaller foundation partners in local projects, and the smaller foundation has become insolvent. The local people still need this help. And so the larger foundation feels, I think very understandably, the compunction to bail out the smaller foundation, make sure that there's not a cessation of services to a local community, lessening their ability to be responsive to some of these. But we're um, making um, the rounds again of some of these foundations and trying to convince them that um, having some money that can be devoted to startup kind of projects, especially for people at the other end of the uh, life cycle from Warren and me, well, Warren's younger, but other end of the life cycle, is, is really, really important because of our need to build capacity here. And we don't have a critical mass yet in this country of people who not only have the emotion to want to do global health work, but who have the training and the cultural competence to do it effectively. So it's good that you have the curriculum and uh, funding is an issue. The first thing I would do is, is talk to people locally. The second is to look for possibilities across the campus, which for example, Dr. Hadjar's office can let you know if there is or there isn't for what you're looking for. And then we're, um, I am trying and others are trying to be your spokespeople to try to make sure that initiatives come out. So for example, in that uh, Africa US higher ed initiative, we're spending a lot of time in DC uh, trying to make sure that in all of the fervor to get the U.S. economy straightened out again, which of course is very, very important, that we don't forget about the need to continue funding these kind of capacity building projects in the developing world. And um, we have had some, some responsiveness and we'll find out how much during this next session of Congress where we have some specific uh, things, um, um, irons in the fire or whatever the Washington word is, I always forget. Questions? Yes, how you doing? Uh, my name is Lena Macaroon. I'm a second year medical student here, and it was really a pleasure to hear you speak, so thanks Thank for you. coming. Thanks for saying that. Um, so you touched on the um, aspect of capacity building uh -huh. um, as one way that universities can be involved in global health and global development. I was wondering if you might share your opinion on kind of another take of it, which would be the role and responsibility of universities and specifically Cornell um, in ensuring that medical technologies that are developed in our university laboratories are made accessible to people in developing countries. Yeah, I'm Next. aware of the effort that you guys are doing uh, in the meeting that you're going to have with Alan Powell and I, it's very important. <clears throat> I oversaw a research park and a business incubator and a tech transfer office in an earlier life for about 10 years and um, there's really as I see it, you, you guys are focusing more on it, so uh, you may have much more in-depth knowledge, but I think there's three shoes that have to fall. Uh, how can you have three shoes fall when you just wear two shoes? Maybe Warren and me both. Three shoes and we just have one extra that have to fall.